Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Stephen Napolitano, First American Title Insurance Company, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Urban American. <music>
office, multifamily, retail, industrial, now we have a new asset class, distressed debt. Now, what, since all of us have been around in the, in the times of the 90s, what changes, what's the difference today than 1993 with the RTC and, and so on? What happened then? How do you look at that market and compare it to the, to the market today on distressed debt? Well, I think today the, the, the moniker distressed debt is, is a very attractive one to investors. And I think people don't want to buy the real estate, they want to buy the debt, thinking that the debt is the way to go and will get you the real estate, which isn't necessarily the case. It's not so simple sometimes, especially if you're not the borrower buying back the debt, but rather a third party buying back the debt. So I think that, uh, again, the, the, the concept of distressed debt as a way to attract capital into transactions is new terminology. Now, you know, I, I strategically put, the, he represents banks, Doug represents banks, and you, I mean, you all do, but you represent more borrowers and so do you. That's why the tag teams are done this way. So how do, you, how do your clients look at negotiating distressed debt today? Or how are they dealing with the banks, you know, his terrible clients, especially when you have to deal with a person like him. Good point. Um, when you've had two years of, of, of limited activity, people have had a lot of time to work on this and think about it, and um, what's finally happening is that the lenders have reached a point where they're ready to part with the debt. Um, for a lot of my clients, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to buy back debt, and in some cases at discounts, in some cases at par, and move forward with projects that have uh, been in the works for years. So for them, it's a, it's a great opportunity and it's a good market to be doing it. Now, are your banks that you're rep representing, are they taking back paper from clients of his and his? I mean, or they say, just, I'll, I'll make you a deal. I want to sell the debt, but go somewhere else to find the, the, the way to pay it off. Well, it really depends on their behavior. In this market, there there have, uh, uh, been constructive discussions many times with the borrowers and the banks and everyone understands the valuation issue, everyone understands the non-recourse nature and so they're looking at it differently rather than engaging in litigation, starting foreclosures, whatever. Now what, what if they have, what if the borrower personally guaranteed that loan? What, what, do you, what happens today? Well, I think that's the, the key. The key in all of this is the contract. And when it's non-recourse loan, the lender says, I made a $100 million loan. My asset is worth $80 million. If I can sell my debt for $80 million, that's all I'm going to recover at the end of the day in the foreclosure. Let me be nimble, get it off my balance sheet, and sell it for what the asset is worth. When there is a guarantee, and let's face it, so much of commercial real estate now is non-recourse or is non-recourse with carve-outs, exceptions, the bad boy guarantee, the exploding guarantee. You, you know, since we have people, you know, let's not play inside baseball. You know, tell what, 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 what does recourse mean? Oh, sure. What does a carve-out mean? You know, I, I mean, you know, there are viewers saying, they're saying, what is this? Stoller is not talking English today. Oh, sure, sure. In, in English, when a loan is non-recourse, it means the lender agrees only to look to the value of the collateral or to the asset, which is a piece of real estate. And, and carve-out? And a carve-out is an exception to non-recourse. So non-recourse means if you behave well as Doug pointed out, the sole liability that the guarantor will have will be to give back or to lose that property. So are you saying that if his, what, what is non-behaving? You, you, what, what do you have, what kind of behavior do you want? In 2008 or 2009, my property wasn't worth this. You lent me money because you, at that time you said it was great for me to lend you money for a vacant building because you were going to be able to release that building and get new tenants for the number. His borrower, his client, has the building. Unfortunately, in 2009, nobody signed leases. You know, 2010, the, first, the beginning of the year wasn't good, but the end of the year worked out well. So he says to you, hey, people weren't signing leases. That's this not a bad act. 
the bad acts and the bad acts can take on a life of their own and they have done that over the last 10 years. A typical bad act by a borrower is to file for bankruptcy protection, which separates or delays the lender from realizing. Uh, you know, I watch those ads on TV between the Super Bowl and yes, I was working out in the gym. I heard this guy say, there's nothing wrong filing bankruptcy. You know, I saw one of those ads on New York One, you know, file bankruptcy. Well, that's that may be true because sometimes you need bankruptcy to clean up the process. However, when you're using it as a club to the lender saying, maybe pay me to go away. I'm not going to lose my investment on this, so pay me to go away. And that happened a lot. And it, so these non-recourse carve-out guarantees have really addressed that issue in a, in a fairly significant way. But even where it's in the borrower's best interest, it's a matter of contract between a borrower and a lender going into the transaction. You can't use bankruptcy against me, whether it's in your interest or not. Right. And, the, you know, the last time it was a, it was a very common uh, phenomenon, last bad, bad cycle in real estate, a lot of owners filed in bankruptcy. It, it, it delayed things. Uh, sometimes it was a ploy. Sometimes it was legitimate. Um, lenders wanted to be in a position to say, if it's right, then I'll make that decision, not you. Now, how is a lender today saying how much they want to get you? I, I heard, uh, you know, uh, Keith bring up before or Doug bring up the situation that certain lenders are getting a hundred cents on the dollar. How's the judgment? How, how does a bank or how does a borrower make a determination what they want to pay or well, what they want to get for the money? Well, again, the marketplace is usually the first place to look, right? And, and up until recently, there really wasn't an active market. There wasn't a lot of money or the banks were not prepared to really make deals and sell assets. So a more vibrant market allows for market pricing. And when there's market pricing and there's a quality borrower or there's not a quality borrower or operator, that's what goes into the decision-making process. Now, you know, here's a, an interesting question. If you're a bank, especially the two of you represent banks more than you on this situation, if you're a bank, how do you, do you say, I want to sell it myself, I want to use an intermediary, or I want to go to one of these auction houses. How, what, what are they, how are they making a decision in 2000? I mean, in a lot of respects, it it's, depends on the institution. Some of them feel that they have the uh, internal staff that can, can make those decisions, and their port portfolios may be such that they can gauge what, what values really are as opposed to uh, other lenders who just don't have that capability, and so they need to go out and find a third party. Now, he, but here's the the big situation. As I as I brought out earlier in the show, you know, there were a number of uh, real estate equity funds um, last year underwritten. Uh, they came out; they were less than they were in the prior years. But out of the nine out of the ten top real estate funds that were created last year, they were for distressed debt. So everybody wants to buy distressed debt. When it comes to a large loan, a big transaction, you know, it's those people. Those are the astute people, the Starwoods, the Fortresses, the Brookfield, the people, the Aria. They, they know that business. What happens when, I hate to say, the, the, in the dot-com age and the day trading age, people would say, you know, I want to buy this Internet company. I still remember one of my friends who's in the catering business telling me that he was speaking to an attorney that you all know, and the attorney said, Paul, maybe you want to invest and, and be part of this distress. We're buying some distressed debt. It's not as easy as it looks, right? Well, I do think, I think everything is tied to appraised value. And, and the, you know, we, we talk about the MAI appraisal, and we jokingly say MAI is made as instructed. So it really depends on who is commissioning the appraisal no, and no, for what I'm, purpose. I'm, here's, that's not my question. My question is, you know, in the early 2000s, people were saying everybody wanted to be in the dot-com. Everybody wanted to be a day trader. And today, when people hear this term distressed debt, the average consumer says, you know, maybe I could buy that distressed debt because they watch on TV also, buy this home, you know, you can buy that. What do you say to people when they want to say, I want to invest in distressed debt? Well, it's not a passive activity. I mean, if you're investing with somebody who knows what they're doing, you know, the distressed debt is, is uh, a mechanism to get to the real estate. Uh, maybe the debt will be paid off. 
maybe you end up with the real estate, but, but the, the analysis is uh, if the real estate is fundamentally good, then, and you're buying the debt at the appropriate uh, pricing, you end up with the real estate, you've done very, very well. How long does it take someone who buys debt to get to the real estate? You know, there are courts, there are potential bankruptcies, there are other ways. I mean, can you get to own that land or that building within six months? It depends what's going on with the <clears throat> borrower. I mean, in some of these cases, when by the time the debt is being sold, the, the borrower is actively involved in the process. The borrower may be part of the buying group. Um, if you're starting with a situation where there's been no contact and uh, you're, you're taking the, the wild card risk of a, of a foreclosure, it could take years. We have, we have matters that have, that have been in litigation uh, for literally years at this point. And of course, that'll affect the value of what the bank is going to recover if they sell the distressed mm -hmm. debt. And then it also depends who else is in the stack. Are you buying the sole debt, the MES debt? Which piece are you buying? What, what's everyone else's interest in the game? It's a complete it, pricing point. Wait, but, but wait a second. Didn't, uh, I'm not sure who mentioned it prior to the show that there were two very astute uh, purchases who bought debt a couple of months ago last year, and they didn't get to the asset. Uh, there was S.L. Green, very sharp guys. They bought the debt on 510 Madison, and they subsequently they wanted it, but Boston Properties bought the deal. Then there's still the ongoing litigation on Three Columbus. So even though, even though you buy the distressed debt, you sometimes don't get it. Well, sometimes the worst case is you just get your yield on your investment and you get your money back. Not the end of the world if everything works out. The more difficult situation is you don't get to the asset and then you get crammed down or otherwise lose money on your investment. Now, all of you have people who come to you and say, I want to buy distressed debt. How do you, what do you say to them? Do you say, what's the default interest rate? Who are the borrowers? I think the first question, Mike, is why? Do you know the asset? Do you know the borrower? Who are the other people in the stack? You have to, what, what's your underwriting? Why do you want to buy it? What's your experience? What's your team? Can you do it? Is it a flip? What's your goal? Well, one of the things that I always tell distressed debt purchasers is to know the, um, know the loan documents, know the status of the default. Is there a matured loan? If it's a matured loan, it's very difficult to raise defenses in a foreclosure. Is there a less material default? What are the guarantees? Are the guarantors deep pockets so that if they file for bankruptcy or if they interfere with the process, there could be some liability by them? I must say, I also tell distressed debt purchasers, how nimble are you in dealing with the borrower? I mean, that is, is I, I think it's nimble dealing with the borrower and how nimble are you to close on time? What I've seen is that many banks, especially it was the end of December, and they said, okay, it's time to get some things off the books. So they'd make a phone call to their friendly purchasers of distressed debt, and they said, if you buy this quickly, I'll give you a discount, you know, or I'll make this type of deal. You know, it's like the, they say, you know, it's like that those January sales, you know, you go into Bloomingdale's. If you get there on just before Martin Luther King's birthday, you can get that suit for 25, 30 percent off. Can you buy well, it from the banks also at the end of a quarter? There have always been buyers and buyers. And, and whether it's the names you've mentioned or other names, there are people who are known as closers and there are other people who are either known as not closers or flippers or people who aren't really known in the community. And that becomes, I think, an issue. This, this year end, you, you had banks who said, look, if it's done by January 1st, we're fine. If it's not done by January 1st, come back and talk to us later. Um, I, I felt it this December. So here's the other question. You know, we talk about when you're dealing with a bank, you know, there's some humanoid that you can talk to. I've, I've run seminars, and the biggest comment, and the one I ran even for the New York State Society when I had the CFO of Related, the COO of uh, Kimco, and the CFO of Thor saying, if I have to deal with a special servicer, I can't deal with anybody. They don't talk to me. They don't get back to me. You know, and 2011, 2012, there's going to be a lot of those CMBS 
for my audience, collateralized mortgage-backed securities, which are going to come due, which were lent at 102%, at numbers that they can't pay off, what's going to happen in, in 2011, 2012 on those debts? Especially that you're not dealing with a borrower. You're dealing with a special servicer who has a vested interest to take longer than ever to move the deal. And as we talked about before the show, I think the other problem with those loans is the number of people who own pieces in those loans and, and the relationships they have with each other and the bank-to-bank -bank or investor-to-investor -investor dynamic. So, some have no relationship with each other, right. which is part of the problem. I, I must say, I, I must say, not to be contrarian, I think two years ago we all talked about the inaccessibility of special servicers and we called it special servicer paralysis. I don't think that exists right now. I think special servicers have extended and pretended. They do have appraisals in their file. They are looking to move these assets. They have a responsibility for the holders of the debt to move the assets. Some of them are acting in different or unpredictable ways, but two weeks ago, we sold to the borrower representing a special servicer. And that borrower made the case for value and it was all tied to value and we sold it in a week. How long was that transaction in the works though? Weeks. That's terrific. Weeks, wow. absolutely weeks. Now I will say a different special servicer, very similar facts. I, I actually am on the borrower side no return phone call. So what we're seeing is movement towards, even the CMBS marketplace, movement towards moving assets off the books. But to Mike's point, when, when the tsunami comes, those people will be stressed and they'll have more on their plate. But it's, a great, it's great news. Uh, I also think on that, see, by the time the tsunami comes, which we, we all hear very, very large numbers for 2011, 2012, I think CMBS is going to be back. I think there's going to be a new class of borrowers. There may be more conservative underwriting than existed in 05 and 06, but I think those loans are going to be available. Now, you know, let's wear our hats in a different manner. When you represented the bank not for debt, just in general last year, and when you represented your borrower at the beginning of January of 2010, if you represent an insurance company, the rates were 7.5%. The debt yield was 11 to 12%. The loan to value was 50% or 60%. 12 months later, the world changed. Remember I said before the show, Four New York Plaza sold for $97 a foot. 660 Madison Avenue sold for $1,100 a foot. 1330 sold for $770. Nobody thought that these prices were going to return so quick. Two years ago, you couldn't sell a piece of land. I mean, if you had a borrower, the, the <clears throat> bank said, I, what am I going to do with vacant land? People today are looking at vacant land. How do your banks look at the land that they may own or they don't, that they have a loan on? They're not happy to have it, and certainly there are players out there. Some of the home builders are coming back. I mean, again, a lot of that vacant property uh, is held, was held by the banks because the home builders went down. Now some of them are coming back, and they, they want to pick up uh, these assets at, at a good price obviously to make some money. Now, are we talking, you know, I mean, I, I know we're New York-centric, but there, there are certain cities you know, AFIRE, the Association of Foreign Investors in Real Estate, they said there are five major cities, and every, there are five major cities. New York is number one, Washington is two, maybe Los Angeles, Boston, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. What about real estate around the rest of the country, which all of you are involved with for borrowers and, and banks? What's happening with regard to their debt? The Chicago is vibrant. I don't know whether Chicago makes the five. On they didn't make five. the five, but this... But they make it, make it, maybe they make it six, make it seven, make it eight. Chicago is vibrant. We have an office there. They're busy. They're doing a lot of deals. So got probably some other stuff. You know, I, I, was, I was actually thinking as you were talking earlier and you were mentioning some New York assets. I think New York is absolutely aberrational. I don't think we have seen the distress in New York that other parts of the country have seen. I think you have some markets and the home builders in Southern California and Central California and Arizona are still struggling. There are very soft spots in other parts of the country. New York is just a great bubble. Can I go across the river? Do you think when office buildings in New Jersey are selling for $80 a foot, 
There's no office market in New Jersey. A bank who has an office building in New Jersey could just be sitting there. Well, except smaller, it's interesting. We've had clients buy smaller assets in New Jersey, office assets. So again, Jersey has smaller buildings, the right building, the right buyer. I mean, if we, we take away Hoboken, Jersey City and certain markets, but if we take, you know, the Princeton Corridor Persephone, or, or Persephone, Morristown, there's nothing happening. I mean, you know. Small, building, small buildings are trading, which is interesting. Small buildings are trading where you have a single lender, you don't have a, a big capital stack, and you have a borrower come in, tens of millions of dollars, not hundreds of millions of dollars, pick it up, whether it's medical office, when we talk about, we talk about different classes of real estate before versus just distressed or non-distressed. Those banks are making deals and people are coming and buying the assets. Multifamily. Multifamily. Multifamily well. is strong yep. throughout the country. So in Connecticut, I think you're seeing a level of activity exactly as right. well. So what happens, are banks going to go back to their ways? Are they going to say, are they going to ask for recourse in 2011, 2012? They won't get it. They get the non-recourse guarantee carve-outs. That's, that's my experience. And I, think, and I think the bank's experience with those carve-outs is that they've worked yeah, pretty they've well. Worked. I, I, I don't see a lot of pressure to increase the level of recourse borrowing, but uh, you know, the amount of loans are, are what they are. The, the percentages that they're willing to lend are lower. And you have a number of banks that are all chasing the same deal. And so they're going to uh, structure their covenants I, I, I think Doug is right on the key. There are banks in the market and they're all looking at the same asset. Right. Here's an interesting thing, though, on, on your distressed debt point. I believe and I've seen the banks that are financing the purchase of distressed debt are requiring recourse until their borrowers convert ownership of those loans to the real estate. With one last comment, because we've finished the time, also, the bar, if the bank is taking back paper, they're asking for an interest reserve because yes. it's taking yes. a little right. time, yep. which is something that has to be brought out that everybody wants type of interest reserve so they can pay the debt. I'd like to thank Bob Wertheimer, Doug Wilsner, Keith Paddits, and Richard Fried. See you next week. Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Stephen Napolitano, First American Title Insurance Company, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns, and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Sterling & Sterling, Urban American. Music